Click one. <laughs> <laughs> so in three, two. Good afternoon. As chair, I now call to order the January 22nd, 2024 meeting of the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on a, an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Mr. Bazemore or Ms. Seabolt if you have to leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Seabolt, please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Drummond? And Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Thank you. Ms. Siebel, please call the role of staff members and guests participating in today's meeting. Sure. Mr. Baysmore? Present. Ms. Charlie Green? Present. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other staff members on the call? No, nope, I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you. And the first item on the agenda is legislative priorities. And for that, I call on Mr. Tony Bazemore, and I'll jump in um, also with um, the, the uh, priorities. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to all the board members, Vice Chair uh, Pumphrey. Um, we did a lot of work this year on our legislative priorities, and uh, Madam Chair wanted to uh, focus on Baltimore County Public Schools and our, lo and our local um, you know, initiatives that we're doing. So the, uh, what you're going to see today um uh is is it will be focused on baltimore county public schools and it'll lay out um our legislative priorities for this upcoming upcoming session so i just want to publicly thank madam chair for all the time you spent doing this and helping us to 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 tweak it to make it more focused on what we're doing here um in baltimore county so so with that uh madam chair i think i'll turn it back over to you um uh, to go through uh the priorities and again thank you in this and all the members uh, for working on this document. We appreciate that. OK, so um, while we're transitioning to the document that shows the legislative priorities, um, we at our last meeting, we talked at a high level about these priorities. And so then what we did was crafted a draft to get a little more granular with the priorities. So definitely want the feedback of the um, of committee members uh, for around these legislative priorities. And so if you could scroll down a little bit. Uh, so in the introduction, we emphasize that we, um, we're in support of, of all of the priorities that the Maryland Association of Boards of Education has, cha has shared. And so we didn't want to repeat that in our uh, legislative priorities. We didn't just want to do a comprehensive list of what they've already done. So we put that up front in the um, introduction, and we also um, emphasize that we do not support any unfunded mandates. So um, this can be a, a financial strain on the school system when there is legislation passed that requires a fiscal, um, that requires some type of fiscal support, and that fiscal support is not allocated to the school system, then we have to modify the budget to meet that mandate. So we um, put that up front that we don't support any unfunded mandates. Um, nor, and we also do not support any legislation that is not explicitly aligned with the goals of our school system. So once again, this is a very Baltimore County focused lens. So um, let's scroll down to the first priority. And, um, and, and when we think about enhancing teaching and learning, what we've heard from teachers, and you know, I'm thinking about that TABCO legislative breakfast that we attended, 
it was around reducing class sizes. And so well, in, informally talking with some of the teachers um, that came up, this reduction in class sizes. And so we followed that up with the why, like why is this important? And we could have brought in all the research, but what we know is that when you have smaller class sizes, you do have improved student outcomes because what you have is now teachers are able to give more of an individualized attention um, to students. Teachers are able to better manage behavior and, um, and it just becomes a, a more manageable class size than having 30 or, or 26 kids in one class. Um, but in order to reduce class sizes, you have have to have the infrastructure to do that. So step one, do you have enough space in the building if you wanted to if you wanted to take your English language arts sections from three to four so that you can reduce those class sizes? So this re um, reducing class sizes first talks about ensuring that we have that infrastructure, the support um, to do that. So what we have placed here is um, number one is increasing the development impact fees and ensuring that there is a dedicated capital fund fee to support con public school construction and that proactively addresses overcrowding. So this will get at the, you know, this expansion of communities that are happening all around the county by having additional fees that can go specifically for um, construction in public schools that can help if we need to do renovations, expansions, um, build new schools. Um, and then we, we really do want st the state to incentivize school systems um, that support reducing class sizes. So when you talk about adding additional teachers, because that, that'll be another piece, if you want to reduce class sizes, you may need more teachers. Um, and so if we could have support in with those teacher salaries or um, any type of incentives to help subsidize the cost that comes with reduction of class sizes. And then um, providing incentives that support public private um, partnerships that expand enrollment opportunities for public school students. And so when we think about um, our special needs students and sometimes they need, may need more support than we can handle or that um, that we can have within the school building and they may need to go to one of the private facilities if the state could help to subsidize some of those costs. Um, we just want to make sure that that last bullet is ensuring that all of our students have have the options that will best meet their needs, whether it's offered explicitly through Baltimore County Public Schools or through a private partnership. So that's the first priority. The second priority is um, around the out of school time learning experiences. So when we look at um, the root causes of behavior in school, a lot of it originates outside of school. And then what happens is students come into the building and the teachers and counselors and school administrators then have to deal with whatever happened on social media that night. So the goal of this, um, this priority is really to keep our students engaged in something productive even while um, while they're even not in the during their official school day. So this is looking at incentivizing programs like um, expanding opportunities in rec centers and um, other out of school time programs that really help to complement what's happening in the school day. So whether that is complementing the arts learning experiences, complementing um, athletics, complementing um, music, complementing the English or math, um, but we should really be looking looking at um, supporting outside entities to keep our kids engaged outside of the school day. And um, community schools are huge. We're hearing it from our from all of our constituents. We need the state to provide additional funding for community schools. And so and that can also help with all the wraparound services. And once again, just making sure our students are engaged at all times. And then if we go to our third priority, um, innovative school schedules. So in order for, uh, you know, we know that there is a ton of research that shows that some students can benefit from being on a trimester schedule. Some students can benefit from um, modifying that 180 day, um, that, you know, 1000, uh, a little over a thousand hour requirement in the school um, for the school calendar. So what this is, it's putting the power back in the hands of local school systems to create a school schedule that best meets the needs of their students. And so what we are requesting are um, modifications to two statutes that are to a statute that's currently in the books that um, either have a day or hour requirement, but not both. 
And then um, that statute also restricts innovative school schedules um, models to low performing or at risk public schools. And we want that removed because even our most gifted students um, who are in some of those high performing schools could benefit from innovative school schedules. So this just provides flexibility. Um, and then the last bullet point as far as incentivizing school systems to implement innovative school calendars, it is expensive when you start to modify the calendar um, or the hours that a student is in school. We know that it costs over $30 million to do an extra 15 minutes. Um, and so in order to have a systemic innovative school schedule approach, we would need the state to incentivize um, innovative school calendars. I don't see how we can do it just on the, the current operating budget that we have for Baltimore County. We would need that infusion of funds to support if additional teaching time is needed. If we're going to add additional minutes to certain classes, um, we, we're going to need the funds to support that. And then um, you could scroll down to the to the last piece. And that is it. And so we wanted to just really have a focus on a couple of key things in addition to everything that Mabe has um, identified, but this keeps it really focused. So I want to pause here, um, you know, and to see if Ms. Lichter, Ms. Pumphrey, um, do you have, what, what are your initial thoughts? What modifications do you want to see? Um, let's engage in a little bit of discussion around that. Can we bring it back? Can you bring it back up? Um and then I have some comments when you are ready for me. I am ready for you. <laughs> okay, um, so the, the, the first one. Um, oh, okay, right. So my, con my concerns are when we say increased development impact fees is that there are impact fees, you know, but they're not working because of the number of exceptions. Um, that are included. So I just want to make sure as, as whomever starts to message this acknowledges that because that's coming from our county executive who will get our budget next. So I don't want us to sound like there hasn't been any work done in that area, even though the um, exceptions are what is not making it fruitful. So I just want to make sure that um, that, that message goes out. Um, as far as that piece. Um, and then the only thing with the um, the class sizes, and I totally agree, don't get me wrong, I totally agree. I just make sure that when we're messaging it, schools are still being staffed though on the number of students, not their capacity. So I just make, I mean, so we, we gotta be careful that we're not giving the message that we have, just, our class sizes are so large because we're not giving them the staffing because there's not the room. They still get that staffing to, re, to hit the ratios. Um, so I just want to make sure that we make sure that we message that because that becomes then a huge talking point for the public that our school, that our classes must be at 30 and 32 if they're and they're and hopefully unless I'm wrong and I know um, that Ms. Charlie Green's on that we're still staffing based on number of kids and not on the room, which makes it difficult, and I realize that, and I've been part of the relocatables and all those pieces, but that we're still um, staffing based on the number of kids and not the space available. So just I'm just kind of concerned a little bit about the messaging to make sure that we get that um, that one correct. Um, do you want me to say anything about the other ones? You want to just stick to this one first? Um, we'll we'll stick to this one first, and mm -hmm. I like that that catch. And so, Mr. Baysmore, maybe we could tweak the language a little bit because Ms. Lichter's right. We don't want to give the impression that every class in Baltimore County is overcrowded. Um, so we we don't definitely don't want to do that. So we could tweak the language, um, and and that's also a good catch with that development impact fee. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Uh, uh, well, Ms. Lichter mentioned the same thing I was going to say about the um, impact fees, but also wondering if we should mention something in there about the APFO task force recommendations. So what specifically would you like to? Um, I just I just know that that was a that there was a report out there that wasn't that's still were, still sort of not being followed completely. Part of that's impact fees, but there are other other parts that come in as well. And I'm just not sure. I think maybe that both need to be mentioned so that we're following um, some of the some uh, part of that report that's already been researched. And so then I'm just thinking about making it, you know, this user friendly for the public. Um, 
we should put like some specific if, if we pull those recommend the recommendations that we really want to focus on and put it in there um so that it's not so that we're not just saying we want to implement what's in the report but we're pulling out some key things um so that people don't feel like they have to then go read the full report to understand what we're talking about does that make sense Yes, that makes sense. And, and also, I mentioned that just because, you know, working in partnership with our county council members, I know that for several of them, that's important. And I just want to make sure that they know that we're aware that that report is done and that some of them are also focusing on implementing that more effectively. Okay. Yep. Mad Madam Chair? Yes. Um, we could also, um, uh, this is a food for thought, we could, we could um, acknowledge the APFO task force um, uh, and recommendations that the council came up with and put in a link to the actual APFO so that people who wanted to get a little bit more information and, and that's not saying that we're following every edict of it because that's the council's um, um, work but it acknowledged we are acknowledging that there is you know a task force that was created and they came out with recommendations and if you want to get further information you can click the link and it'll take you to their website yep. with because they have a lot of information over there on the APFO. Yep, that that seems that sounds good. And I just think it's important because of our partnership to um, acknowledge the the work that they've done on that. That's that's sort of what I'm getting at here. Although I see what you're saying about you know being specific for the public, I also think it's important for us to show support and that we're working together. I agree. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Of course. Um, with um. Uh, Jane Lichter, you, do we want to work through the additional language now to capture what what try to capture, um, you know, her uh, remarks about the um, um, staffing and class size, and, and then I think we just talked about the impact fees. So, would it be appropriate to do that now? Yes, it would be. And and I'm not sure whether we need to change the wording to the second one or just in the messaging when we're when whomever is standing in front of others just to make sure that we don't combine the idea of um, our buildings being overcrowded right. as a definite alignment with our class sizes being too large. So I don't know if it would fit there as part of adding words, but I just think the messaging, we just have to make sure we are not giving the impression that if your school is over 110 percent overcrowded, you are your class sizes are going to be larger because that's I don't think the case. Um, Mildred, that's is that or Miss Charlie Green, is that the case? Any that, that is the case. And so <clears throat> I, I I came on camera to say pretty much what Tony said that there we can offer some language that might clarify and it might just be important mm -hmm. just to state exactly how schools are staffed. Uh, just to say that in the affirmative um, and then, you know, perhaps list bullets and why it's important to look at smaller class sizes. So schools are staffed based on enrollment. Um, you know, research says, you know, smaller class sizes and what have you and incentives that allow and, you know, uh, support school systems that continue to do that important work. You know, that's the focus of this uh, legislative priority. So um, a little jumbled up in my head right now, but I think I've got a clear idea of the kind of messaging. Um, and I think it's really stating exactly how we do it and then moving into uh, what we'd like to prioritize might be the best way of approaching it. Yep, I like that, Miss Charlie Green. Me too. OK, so we'll, we'll let you all wordsmith it and get, get back to us on it. And, and then for clarification for that third one, are, are you saying that we're trying to get kids out of private schools and into the public school system? Is that what that one is? No, so this is really focused on um, there are certain situations where a student may need to go into oh, a private yeah, setting. Especially one right now, I remember that. OK, yeah. but yeah. Um, doesn't the state already provide some of the compensation for the for those placements? If they do, is it enough? Um, and and I, I don't. I don't want to speak on behalf of all the, the the special ed parents who've had to go through the process of trying to do this, but I don't know if it's an I, I doubt it that it's enough. And then this also just allows for um, just expanded opportunities. 
Um, not necessarily we don't we don't want to get kids out of our our school system, but just recognizing that when it's needed money, enough money should be there to allow it to happen. Right, but I just don't want to give the impression that we're not doing now currently what's in the best interest of our kids who have very significant needs and need that placement. So I guess I'm just concerned about messaging that we because that can take it in and, and people get a, a thought like that, you know, that's going to take them on a whole nother tangent that we're not giving kids, you know, what they need based on their IEP. Now, is it complex? And yes. And is it expensive? Totally. Um, so I just, I just, we have to, I just want to make sure that we acknowledge what is happening, that they are giving us some funds. Of course, it's never, it's never going to be enough. Um, and then just in making sure that the wording doesn't, because I, I, I remembered you said it, but if I read it again, I, I'm going to school choice. I'm going to, we don't believe in the private schools. You know, I'm going to all different tangents when you were really talking about making sure our kids with their most significant needs are getting the placements they deserve. So um, just worry about when people read it when they're not um, familiar with what you're trying to say. That's also what I was going to say. Re reading this, when you explained it, I, I totally got the end, especially being a board member, but I think reading it as a parent and part of the public and not necessarily engaged um, as a board member, uh, we don't see the very specific circumstances in that last bullet, I think. I'm not quite sure how to make it, um, you know, make that show more, but um, that's my concern as well. And immediately school choice popped in my mind, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Ms. Charlie Green. I wanted to just offer it, and, and perhaps this was the intent, that might it not also include the work we're doing around expanding uh, opportunities at pre-K level for very young learners as we are working with private daycare providers to make sure that they are getting that early start. So um, that that is an area of you know significant growth as outlined by the, the blueprint. So I think there's some some other places that, you know, perhaps, you know, depending on where what your lens is, that that you might that might be conjured up in your head, but we can certainly uh, help with any language that might make that more plain. So whatever yes. direction you'd like to go in, we can do that. Yes, so please wordsmith that as well, because we don't want to give the impression that um, we're just sending our kids to private schools. Understood. OK, anything else with reducing class sizes? Okay, we can go to the next. Okay, expanding out of school time learning. Um, Ms. Lichter, did you have any feedback for this one? I do, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I want it, yes. <laughs> um, I totally agree. I'm just thinking about implementation if it can't like and our focus on making sure that student achievement is our complete paramount focus and that the superintendent and our staff are working on that if we went to more flexible um scheduling that's a huge initiative and a huge undertaking so that's why that's why i wasn't going to kind of bring it up because it could be far in the future, it might not, you know, it might not happen, but it's just the PR to be done with families and then with schools who've never done anything like this. It would be a huge effort and I just don't want us to get away from first the effort of making sure our kids can, um, you know, their proficiency levels. But I also know that this could help in some cases, so that's why I was like kind of stalling, um, it, but I know that it would be a huge undertaking. Yeah, so with this one, so this isn't like expanding the schedule of the school. So this is the school day is over. The kids go to a rec center. They go to a club. They go to they go to something where they're just not sitting at home. OK, um, maybe so I was thinking of the other one. Was the other oh, one flexible school schedule? Yep. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. I'm good with this. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. 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 That's OK. I just have one comment. I love this. I'm just wondering if somehow we might um, be able to include language that mentions that we're, we want to work with the Department of Park and Recs. 
together and collaboration or expand our collaboration because we already do have that um, partnership. Just a thought. And so I don't know, I don't want to limit it to just parks and recs like I use that because we already work with them, but I know there are a lot of other out of school time experiences, uh, you know, organizations that we could potentially partner with. And so, um, so I wouldn't want to limit it to just parks and recs. And then if we do expand, then, uh, you know, I just wonder about staffing and the workload. Um, for the the central for the central office staff to coordinate all of that. And so the initial steps that I'm that I was just thinking here is that could we at least get more opportunities for students to go into these programs at little to no cost? Um, because we know that this sometimes is a barrier and then um, and then we you know this is almost like just level one and then we could you know, every year add something to this to to get it to where it needs to be. OK. OK, we can go to the next priority. That's what I was talking about. Sorry. All right, this one. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Lichter. I already I already talked about it. Just just the I, mean, I don't know how long something like this would take. I know that um, Anne Arundel County superintendent kind of last, I don't know if it was last season or um, session talked about this. So it could be far off in the future when um, Dr. Rogers is more established in her tenure and we're on that that lovely upward trajectory. I'm just that, I just know how hard this is gonna be to get our, our kids um, to be able to improve. So everything I said before was about these. Yep, and I agree with you. Um, so with this, this is just about if we could at least get the law modified so that when we're ready to move with something like this, the law isn't the barrier. Because right now it does just feel like there's this brick wall up. Um, and if at least we could, you know, remove that wall and then we could start having those real discussions about what would this look like in Baltimore County? How much money would this cost? Where would the money come from? And all of that. But right now it's almost like a non-starter because you can only do it in a low performing or at risk public school. And I don't even know how that's defined. There is no definition. There's no the, at risk. There is a definition for it. Um, low performing. Yeah, but it's not, you know, codified in the law. It's in a um, in the Code of Maryland regulations. So if we can at least just begin by removing this barrier, then that will be allow us to open up discussions in Baltimore County. But while this is there, um, there's really not, there's not much that Baltimore County could do to, to even move forward with an innovative school schedule. Okay, um, thank you. When did, um, Tony, did Ann Arnold County Superintendent testify for the, in the government office or did he testify for MSDE? Do you do you remember? Does anybody remember? Uh, Mark yeah, Fidel testified somewhere. I could find out and get back to you. I'm I just was wondering what the go ahead. You know, what happened when he um did that? You know, I guess it didn't go anywhere, but you know, who who squashed it? Was it the MSDE squashing it or was it, you know, somebody in um the senator delegate that squashed it? OK, I, I can follow up on that because that was a local bill in Anne Arundel County, so yeah. um, I, I can follow up on that. Get back to the committee. Okay. Ms. Pumphrey. Um, I just again uh, think maybe this I think this is fine. Maybe again with the messaging of it, though, just to make sure that we're emphasizing this just gives us the flex is going to give us the flexibility and yeah. not any immediate change. Um, you just take, remove, like you said, removes that <clears throat> legal boundary or that that stops us from um, any innovative scheduling. Yep. And so then what I'm hearing is, you know, really for all of these, just to have a little bit more context setting um, is needed so that yeah. we're not we're, we're not um, misleading the public. So I, I like that. Yep. Yeah, because a lot of these could go to if you don't hear the background that you're providing as far as really the what you're trying to accomplish, it can take a whole nother life of its own. So, you know, people could start thinking she's talking about year round schooling. We're talking of, you know, so 
I get the messaging is really important for all three of them. I mean, they're all I mean, I agree with everything. I'm just worried about that messaging and I'm worried about the focus and I just don't want our state and local officials to. Um, not realize that we do appreciate, but we might need more. Yep, I appreciate that. So I and trust that Miss Charlie Green is going to be our wordsmith master. <laughs> I am I am on it and, and Madam Chair, just to make sure that I've heard correctly. I, I, I would like to recommend that we have a little bit more of a narrative format. Like right now you've got a statement followed by bullets, which you know, depending on how you read that statement in bullets, you can infer things that perhaps aren't met. And so I think as part of that context, it's telling a little bit of a story in a paragraph, a very short story, um, but you know, setting that context and then going into this would be helpful. So happy to work on that. That is perfect. And um, Ms. Lichter and Ms. Pumphrey, is there anything else that we need to add? Is there a priority that is burning in your heart that um, we need to get down? <laughs> I'm always behind the universal school meals bills, but I think that's probably covered by um, MABE. You know, just sort of, you know, make sure that that's in. I know that's not specific to Baltimore County, but because we're at a very high level of poverty in Baltimore County, I do think it's important for us. And of course, as you all know, our students can't learn if they have empty bellies. So that's always one of my personal priorities. I think it's covered when we mentioned that at the beginning with, you know, sticking with the state. Uh, I mean, that we um, we are in line with the state um, priorities as well, but just wanted to put that out there to make sure that there's an understanding there for that. Mr. Bazemore, and, and we'll just uh, check with him. That is in the May priorities, right? The meals? Yes, yeah. it is. OK. Yes, ma'am. And Ms. Lichter, are we missing anything? Um, no, I mean, there's lots of wishes, but I think this is pretty, aggr pretty aggressive, not aggressive. Um, it, I just think less is best, especially with the, the broadness and the of these three. My question is just, kind of naivete is so how do we do this how do you go forth and like how do we go you know do you need a do you need someone to sponsor it i mean how do you make these changes through the process mr baysmore do you want to speak a little bit about where, where where do our priorities go do they just go up right. on a hill and die or do um <laughs> <laughs> does something happen with them <laughs> they but what we do is once we um um, have our legislative priorities. It's kind of a guide for our local elected officials in Baltimore County. We send them to our local Senate delegation, our House delegation, and to um, our, our council members uh, in Baltimore County. Um, and, and this gives them a guide as they're putting forth their legislation. They want to make sure a lot of times that they're lined up with our priorities. So um, that's it's more of an informal, like an informative uh, a document so that they have a pretty good idea of what what our priorities are. Um, and then I saw that this was on the agenda for tomorrow night at the at the end to get to vote on them. Are we ready for that? Because as soon as all the board members, we all need to be on the same page. So are we ready for it to be approved mm -hmm. tomorrow night? Or do you think once the changes are made? Um, we should wait. And so we do want to incorporate the changes that you have said. I mean, it would be great if, if you know, I'm mindful of, of the workload. So I'll turn to, you know, Miss Charlie Green and Mr. Baysmore with the wordsmithing. Do you think we'll be able to get something turned around for this board meeting or um, do we need to move it to the next board meeting? So I will, um, I've actually already begun kind of re thinking about these, these uh, ways that we can frame this. Um, I would recommend that you allow yourself some flexibility to push it to the next one, because once we make the changes, it would be my preference to bring it back to you, Madam Chair and members of the committee to make sure that we've accurately captured what it is that we discussed here and there may be additional adjustments. Um, so that that would be my recommendation to allow yourself that 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 level of flexibility because the board members will have questions as well. And so then let um, so then we will at least provide an update of wh where we are and um, what was discussed at the board meeting tomorrow um, and know and give everyone a heads up that we will um, bring the full set of priorities to them um, tomorrow. I mean, at the February board meeting. 
OK, I think it sounds good. Perfect. OK. All right, Mr. Bazemore, I'll turn the presentation back over to you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're going to look at five bills. We have over 100 bills that we are um, tracking and following uh, in the legislature um, this, this session. Uh, and we work very closely with, with, with MABE as well as we're tracking these bills. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chair attends the uh, MABE legislative meetings, which are very helpful and informative um, that all of the other 23 jurisdictions attend as well. So um, we work hand in hand with MABE. Uh, and if there's any bills that you specifically want uh, me to follow um, after I give these five bills, we can we can discuss those as well. Um, we're, we're starting off with House Bill 74. Uh, Delegate Michelle Guyton has sponsored this bill, and it's a um, it's called the Public Schools Lifesaver Schools Program Establishment. Um, and this is uh, House Bill 74. Uh, Senator Guyton, uh, the purpose of the bill is to, is to recognize schools uh, that are providing mental health and behavioral services uh, to our students. She modeled it behind the Green Schools uh, program, where certain schools that are, you know, do certain programs uh, that, that um, helps the environment, they are recognized. Uh, this is the same um, spirit of that. Um, it's not a mandate at all, um, an unfunded mandate as we had talked about at the beginning. Um, it's optional. A school system could opt into this and by implementing um, certain um, uh, specifics of the program, they would be designated and, 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 and called a uh, lifesaver school program. And so that uh, uh, Again, it's not a it's not an unfunded mandate and it's not prescriptive. It's optional. So I wanted to bring that to you to have a discussion. OK, I'll, I'll move on to House Bill 7. Go ahead, Ms. Lichter. She has a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I when you said it, it's kind of like the green school idea, I get the green school idea because I mean, we all should be green schools, but it's OK if we're not. But to be a lifesaver school, I feel like I feel like that gives us a whole reason on I'm thinking of the special permission transfer where special program is at a school and I want to go there because of it. I mean, like to say that this, you know, this school has this lifesaver program focusing on, on mental health or, or social emotional well-being that's better than this one. I just feel like we're opening up a can of worms that I'm not that unless I'm, you know, mishearing it I just worry that as a parent I then I want I want that one and why is that one doing these things to help our kids um, mental health but mine isn't so I just I get the encouragement aspect of it I worry about the perception of the schools that aren't designated as a lifesaver school I, but um, I don't know so just something to listen for as you hear more about it OK, and I'll, I'll keep you um, the committee posted as this bill uh, moves forward in, in, in the legislature. Mr. Bazemore, is this the first time the bill has been introduced? Was it introduced last year? Uh, this is the first year this bill has been introduced, I believe, by um, Delegate Guyton. Um, it was it was received at the hearing. They had a hearing on this bill, I uh, believe Ways and Means, and, it, and because it's not um, prescriptive or, or an unfunded mandate, it, it was received very well as, um, you know, incentive. And, and again, it's optional for, for, school, for schools uh, to opt into this if they chose. And this is about like having all, most of the kids trained in CPR and that kind of, if, if I read the bill correctly, right? Right, and, and mental health um, awareness. Mental health. Um, and, it, and it provides service learning hours for students as well. Um, who are involved in this and uh, so there's a lot of good things in here um, and again for us a lot of times it's, it's, it's if it's overly prescriptive or if it's an unfunded mandate um, but the tone of the um, the committee meeting was you know that it's optional and it's incentive laden and any any other toolbox tools that we have in our toolbox 
to um, encourage um, you know mental health awareness and provide resources is is a good thing. Thank you for that clarification. Yep, Ms. Pumphrey, did you have any questions about that bill? No, I don't. I I um I I I've read through it and I I think it's um I like the idea. I do understand what Ms. Lichter's concerns about, but I think we have other programs in schools also that sort of are you know the school chooses whether or not they want to participate. Um, I would love to have it in every school, but you know, that can't, that's not always a possibility. So, and I think it goes back to the messaging because when, you know, and people understanding what's in, what the specifics are. So it doesn't sound like it's like just the basics that everybody should be getting. So I guess, again, it goes back to just making sure that people understand, you know, what it is to be a lifesaver school. And that doesn't mean that if you're not a lifesaver school, you're not providing the services that kids need. So um, so I guess it goes back again to the messaging piece. OK, okay thank you. And uh, and again, uh, all of these bills, we'll make sure we, we monitor and at our committee meetings, uh, we give updates. So thank you, thank you both. Um, this bill, the next bill is House Bill 75. It has already been crossfired with Senate Bill 377. Um, Delegate, Eb this is Delegate Ebersaw, the chair of our Baltimore County House Delegations Bill. Uh, that um, is really a, a, a bill that that wants to uh, give more flexibility and expand, um, you know, our teacher uh, programs as far as um, attracting new teachers. Uh, retaining teachers and get again giving another tool in our toolbox um, because it's a national crisis and a shortage on teachers that that we can use to attract uh, 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 teachers uh, it's the, the bill is uh, is the teacher development and retention program um, Mabe supports this uh, bill we don't we 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 don't anticipate uh, any issues with this bill moving through? However, you never know. We always have to wait and see till the till the final vote. But anything that we can provide um, to um, help increase our teacher pool, to retain our our teachers, um, and this is a pilot program as well. So, um, you know, we kind of look favorably to this one. Ms. Licker, Ms. Pumphrey, any comments on these bills? All right, we can move to the next one. OK. Uh, Delegate Pasteur, um, this is House Bill 108. Uh, this bill is entitled Baltimore County Board of Education, Non-Student Member Compensation and Student Member Scholarship Alterations. And um, this bill essentially will align Baltimore County Board of Education uh, uh, align them with other jurisdictions as far as the compensation uh, for board members and scholarship for our student. Um, it, it's, it increases um, what we're what you're currently getting. Um, and so I'll turn this one over to uh, Madam Chair and Vice Chair Pumphrey. They may want to weigh in on this. Yes, we provided um, Dr. Savoy and I provided testimony in support of this bill. Uh, to, to right size the compensation for board members and to increase the scholarship that's provided to the student. Um, you know, it, it does it, it does help. Uh, you know, you think about the the amount of time that board members spend on all the duties that we have to do um, outside and for those of us who are just outside of the normal work day. And so it really does right size that that compensation and puts it in alignment with uh, comparable school districts that are our size. So um, and it you know it helps the student member because as we think about the increasing cost of higher ed, um, the student member should it should be reflected in the the what the student member is receiving as well. So um, and so yeah, I don't know if Ms. Pumphrey you have anything to add about this bill or, or Ms. Lichter. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Do we know the amounts they're requesting or that's still up for? Yes. Uh, currently uh, for 
board members is 7,500 7, and mm -hmm. they want to increase it to 16,500 annually. And, okay. also, and also um, increase the student uh, scholarship to uh, 10,000, $10,000. Very supportive of this bill. Yes, Ms. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Lichter. I'm supportive as well, of course. <laughs> um, my question is about the student member, and I we've uh, this has been in discussion before, I think, about the difference and um, why there's a difference between the student member and um, the other board members. I'm just wondering feedback, if anybody has heard any feedback about why it's written that way, the reasoning behind the differing amounts. And so one reason is the student board member does not perform all the duties that the that an elected or appointed member performs. There's certain um, items that the student board member can't vote on. There's certain things that the student member cannot do. And so um, and so this would still put our student board member as the highest paid. Well, the high the, the, our student board member would get the the highest amount of scholarship funds for serving on a board compared to any other uh, school system in the state. Um, so it still significantly increases the the students comp uh, scholarship, but at the same time it um, it recognizes that there are just certain things that the student member is not allowed to do. And so that's one of the reasonings I heard. Mr. Bazemore, have you heard um, any other reasons? That that was pretty much the uh, the thrust of it, uh, Madam Chair. When when I had a uh, conversation with um, the bill sponsor, uh, Delegate Cheryl Pastor. So, uh, thank you. I just wanted some feedback on that. And you know, and I'll just even um, around this increase in compensation. There is an issue of just you know, if you're from a low income household, it can be a financial strain to sit on a board and serve on a board. And so this will this increase will also help to increase the diversity of people who may run for a board seat because now it's not as much of a financial strain on them. So I think that's another reason to consider. Um, you know, not only does it right size the compensation for the third largest school district in Maryland, the 22nd largest in the nation, um, but it also provides that opportunity for it expands opportunity for those from um, from lower income households to hold a board seat without having to um, experience the, the financial strain that it may cause. And then also if, if you had to run, you're also giving up another felt like it was a year of my life, but it, you know, you're also giving up time even before you you enter that and I'm and the money that you end up spending of your own for it. So it's it's um yeah, but I think your comment about low income is is huge. Um and I know I am working on just calculating the amount of hours that we actually spend <laughs> when you think about the committee meetings, the prep for the board meetings, the oral hearings, it, you know, it's it, um, attending all the site visits, school functions, meeting with uh, community members like all of these, all of these things are essential to our governance role and um, and it can be cost prohibitive for board members to truly engage in all of that. So um, we want to encourage, um, you know, I do think that this is, is a good bill. I do think it's the right time for this bill. Um, I know that the concern is, well, you know, if you, I, I have heard, um, well, if we're, we're in the in budget cuts. So how is the board increasing compensation during budget cuts? And I really do think that this is right sizing. I mean, it's never a good time. Um, and so we just have to to focus on the reasons why it is necessary and um, and move forward accordingly. Thank you. Yep. OK, I'll go to the next one, Mr. Bazemore. Thank you, Madam Madam Chair. Um, our next bill is House Bill 116. This has also been uh, cross filed with Senate Bill 84. Um, and uh, at our legisl MABE legislative meeting, uh, we learned that May supports this bill as well, House Bill 116. And again, this is a teacher, uh, a degree apprenticeship program. Um, help, this bill is, is providing compensation and, and pay for teacher apprenticeships programs for, for, uh, to encourage uh, more students to pursue that uh, field and, 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 and break down some of the financial um, um, barriers that, that one may have. It, it also wants to uh, expose and encourage 
uh, students to um, uh, pursue teacher degrees. And so an apprenticeship program is a great way to get hands on learning and be compensated while you're getting that learning uh, while you're pursuing, um, you know, a degree in, in, in a teaching profession. Again, another bill that that will be another tool in all of our toolbox to um, try to increase and retain our, our teacher pool. Any comments on this bill? OK, Mr. Baysmore, you can go to the next one. OK, our final bill is a local bill by uh, Senator uh, uh, Sidnor, who is the chair of our Baltimore County Senate delegation. Um, this bill uh, is entitled the Education Baltimore County School Board Nominating Commission Records and Meetings Requirements. Um, I spoke with Senator uh, Sidnor about this bill. He, what he, he says this bill is simply it's, is, is uh, just wants to increase the transparency in our school board nominating uh, commission process. Uh, when there's an appointment that has to be made, um, this bill will ensure that all that the meetings will be public um, when they're deliberating. Um, he also uh, wants um, the the information to be available for for the applicants who are applying uh, uh, for the commission. So uh, he's calling this his transparency bill. Yeah, Ms. Lichter, Ms. Pumphrey, any comments on this bill? I'm in full support of it. Having gone through this process, um, it, it, having transparency would, I, I think that the community deserves it. They get, they should know well in advance who has um, applied, um, where they are in the process, and they, they should have the right to write in to say something either for or against whoever's um, a part of that, um, that nomination and so um, transparency on a board of education, especially with who's being appointed, I think is is a it's a wonderful um, a wonderful bill and um, that transparency is, is definitely needed. Just I just out of curiosity, it, I mean, this all seemed like such a secretive process for, as far as the nominees and everything. Is there is there a reason why it started out that way and now we're changing it? I just you know. Why did, is anybody aware of why it started out to be such a secretive process where we didn't know any of the nominees, you know, nothing was on an open forum, that type of thing? Is it the way the, way the legislat legislation was written? But just just from my observation, um, uh, Madam Vice Chair, uh, when when this legislation was first introduced and created, it actually was created. Um, we went to a hybrid. Um, they've they've been tweaking this a little bit in the commission. I attend some of the commission meetings. Um, they've been tweaking the original legislation because original legislation never can um, envision all the scenarios that you might deal with. And so I think um, coming out of the last process that Madam Chair went through, I think the individuals on there realized that, you know, the what, what they're proposing now, as Madam Chair said, the transparency being open um, and, and accessible to the public and everyone. Um, that they needed to put something together to, to ensure that that happens because i think that the um some of their bylaws and things are, are silent on that which can open up a lot of other things so this is you know it's a basic transparency bill it doesn't mostly everything else in that section stays the same it's just when you have meetings when you have certain deliberations they the public should be aware and accessible to it okay thank you mm -hmm. We can go to the next slide. I think that was. And I think that's me, Madam Chair. Yes, that that's you. OK, thank you very much. Um, as you can see, we've provided um, links to uh, the House and Senate on how um, anyone on the board or, or any, you know, um, individual or, or as a board, if you wanted to uh, testify, uh, on a bill, um, um, they have very, very, very friendly, user-friendly instructions on how to sign up uh, to speak on a bill, 
Um, it's hybrid again this year. They they started the you know the hybrid approach during COVID. And if anyone wanted to to speak, they can come to the legislature and speak after they sign up, um, or they can uh, testify virtually, uh, which is proven to be pretty popular because, as you know, coming to Annapolis and parking and things of that sort can be a challenge. Um, you can also write you know uh, write a letter and send your uh, testimony into the various committees as well. Um, the one thing you have to do is when you go on this link is create an account uh, on the My MGA. Once you create um, your account, which is very easy, very easy, um, then you just click witness testimony and it'll actually walk you through the information that they need, the, you know, like the bill, the date of the hearing and all of that. Um, the one thing that they're both doing on the House of Senate side is there's a window when you, uh, uh, um, you know, um, apply to testify and it's usually 48 hours before the bill. Um, if it, like today, today is Tuesday. Um, if your bill is Thursday, then today, today is Monday. Is it Monday? Okay. <laughs> Don't mix me I, up. <laughs> yeah, today, I'm telling you, it, it all runs together. But, um, <laughs> uh, but like today is Monday. If you had a bill uh, coming up Wednesday, then you would have to um, go online and, and register uh, from 6 a.m. to uh, 8 a.m. I'm sorry, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and that's that is the window, that 48 hour window. If you miss that, then you're not able to testify. But the instructions and the links that we have here um, is very user friendly, and very easy to to sign up. And as board, as members of the board, um, you have the right to um, sign up and speak as an individual, as some some do. And you would just state that when you um, testify, I'm on the board. Here's my position. But today I'm speaking as an individual or you can speak for the board, you know, and that comes through Madam Chair, um, um, you know, if you're, you know, granted, you know, permission to speak for the, for the full, for the full board, because typically it's the, the chair that speaks for the, for the whole board. But sometimes the, if, if the, um, the chair cannot attend, they can designate someone to speak, you know, on their behalf. So that's pretty much it for that. Again, it's user friendly. Um, and also, I always want to thank um, the members who do take the time to come and testify. That means a lot, especially when you are, when you when you come down and um, in person. The, the virtual is fine; that's fine. But um, typically, when a person takes the time out and come down, that just gives gives a little bit more weight uh, to their testimony, and and the committees recognize that as well. So, any questions on that or? Just a quick comment. Um, I, I have heard from legislators who specifically said they'd love to hear from us and when we testify and like you said, specifically in person. So they do appreciate when we take the time to do that. Um, they are listening. So I just just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you uh, for coming down. I believe you're coming down to, to speak as well. So I um, really appreciate that kind of support. Thank you. OK, and I think. Yeah, I think um, that's it. Yeah, we go to the next slide. I think it was just questions. So any other questions before we, Ms. Lickbear or Ms. Um, Pumphrey? I don't have anything else. Thank you. Okay. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next legislative and governmental relations committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, February 15th, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for everything. Thank Thanks. you, Madam Chair. Thank you.